Okay, here we go again. Um, up to this point, any questions or curiosity or things that you haven't uh, understand? Okay. So this uh, representation is uh, good for the web, which makes easy to present the data and have experts work on the same data from uh, from different. Uh, uh, places. It has been used uh, a lot uh, in study, for example, uh, not only uh, small carvings uh, from Egypt and uh, the, the um, Assyro Babylonese uh, civilization, but also a natural sample like uh, paleont from paleontology, fossil, and so on that present very minute detail that need to be studied in detail. Um, texture of, uh, um, of paintings, uh, as also for conservation and documentation. So it's still not a metric information, but it helps a lot in finding blemishes, uh, document uh, problems of the paintings, and so on. So it has been used a lot on, um, by artwork galleries and so on. Coins. Coins are the perfect specimen for this kind of technology because coins are small. The kind of things that you want to see are in perfection in the, uh, in the dye process, so in the, in the coin age, so when they are pressed. Not, they are not always perfect, and those imperfections are the things that are normally studied to determine the age of the coin, the provenance of the coin, and the uh, relationship between uh, different coins. And moreover, most of these are specular in nature, so they are silver, gold, and other precious metal, and this makes it incredibly difficult to scan uh, them. But every, everything that's in, uh, that is relevant is there. And then has been used to document and study an object which is really fascinating. The Antikythera is a calculator for uh, astronomic phases and moon and tides, uh, dating back to the Greek age. It was found by chance in um, by fishing, they, they took out this piece of uh, corroded uh, brass and metal. And until uh, very few years ago, no one knew what this thing was doing. This thing is actually one of the oldest calculator machines that exist. And it's basically a set of gear, a very complex set of gear. Not all the gear have survived up to, up to now. Uh, but still, it was able to calculate uh, moon phases and uh, all the planetary movements, all the planets uh, known at the time of the Greeks, so not all the nine, but uh, fewer, um, in an automatic way. And all. Uh, it, this was studied very recently using X-ray and other diagnostic machine uh, for the medical use. So we have uh, images of all the inlets and uh, um, RTI to study all the small engravings and the small scratches and all the things that made the archaeologists understand what this mechanism was used for. So. If you don't know about this thing, go and search for Antikythera mechanism and a couple of really nice publications, plus a couple of uh, uh, good video presenting the project. Really fascinating uh, stuff, thinking that uh, back then people were able to create such an object. It's a unique object. This was probably the, 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 um, the production of uh, a very intelligent guy that was not known in everyone else. So he just was able to create one of these and then just disappeared in the history. Or well, it was ages ahead of its uh, era. So pro, 
It's a compact structure, the uh, TI. It's fast and easy to acquire. Fast and easy, we will see that the timings are not so uh, small as you may imagine, like taking photos. Uh, the post-processing is uh, simple enough, so there are tools for the automatic post-process. The rendering results, so what you display to the public is really realistic because you are using data coming directly from photos. Is an image-based representation. Yes, it has a mathematical uh, intermediate uh, representation for storage, but still, most of the data directly come from the photo. So the realism that you obtain is exactly like a photo. Works a lot, uh, works really well for all the kind of objects that present not a 360 degree uh, geometry, but something that is restricted to a depth. Uh, it contains an implicit geometry, uh, an implicit representation of the geometry of the material, even though it's not a metric representation. And it is possible to work on these images because you have much more information than a, symbol, a single uh, photo. So the kind of processing that you may apply to these images is uh, much more informative, much more flexible than what you could normally obtain using a single photo. The bad side is that you have a fixed point of view. is still an approximation because in the end you have uh, a lot of coefficients and you are approximating them with just very few, uh, very small number of parameters. It's impossible to, to represent faithfully object with depth uh, discontinuities with strong with strong depth discontinuities because even though the representation is very close to a photo, you will always lose uh, slightly the sharpness of things like cast shadow and specular light. So if the object is the three dimensionality of the object is uh, uh, is a problem, it is a problem also for the for here. Uh, people have tried compress using uh, uh, PTM, also other stuff like depth of focus. So if you uh, give the PTM instead of uh, um, photos taken with a different point of view, you take photos with a different focus, PTM will work because still this thing is coherent and the things vary smoothly across the set of images. And uh, if you are lucky, you may be able to do things like the time varying effect, but it won't work on very dynamic scene. So it's more a toy than a uh, thing. So we use uh, the PTM to document small objects, to be able to see small fractures and measure them, because I told you it's not a metric thing, but you may have the scale of the, of the photo, so you can take point-to-point me -point measurement on, uh, on some photos. Um, and uh, as far as the project, we worked uh, on a uh, uh, test case, uh, which, was, uh, uh, which were two muse local museums that had a coin collection. If you've ever been to a museum that has a coin collection, you know that displaying in a meaningful way a coin collection is a mess because even just illuminating an entire coin collection means that you normally have one light for each coin, the light is fixed on the coin, and it's a mess if you want to show both sides of the coin, because in that case you will need vertical uh, exposition case, and the coin should be held somehow in order to be able to go back and forth. And every time you want to switch, you have to move all around the, the case just to see the back side of the coin. So coins are terrible because they are small and because there are a lot of those. So we were called by this uh, local uh, museum and uh, they asked for a way to have an interactive kiosk to show uh, some of the, of the collection. So some was already exposed, but uh, most of the coins were not exposed to the public, so they wanted to show more coins and uh, uh, have it in an interactive um, setup with, uh, with a touch screen and the people could browse the collection, could read some uh, historical information about the, the collection and uh, inspect each coin using an RTI. 
so we tried to create a, a thing that was tailored for the museum um, visitor. So really simple to use that could work on, uh, on a touch screen, so single finger um, interaction. And we use it again, web technology, because in this way, with the same stuff, you can publish on a local kiosk and on the web. Because if you're using uh, web technology, we will see in the last uh, two days of the course about publishing data online with a couple of our solution. Uh, trying to write a software tool to present your data, you have uh, a lot of freedom in doing so. So you may have any possible kind of interaction and you may exploit every aspect of your data. However, it's not a reusable stuff and software decays a lot faster than we think. So if you write a custom software, you may have tested on your machine, on your co-worker machine, on your boss machine, but not on any possible combination of hardware and software. And it, it takes very small changes in operating system or video card drivers to make the thing not work anymore. So it was a lesson learned that we, want, we need to use a technology that is somehow stable and even if some kind of interaction is more difficult because you're working inside a sandbox, uh, web technology is this kind of uh, thing. So interactive manipulation of the object, zooming, panning, rotating the coin, changing the light direction, and trying to have a hot spot around uh, the coin. So no, we didn't want to do have a 3D scan plus its appearance because as I said, it's one of the things that, especially for coins, never work. While, on the other hand, uh, reflectance transformation imaging is perfect for this uh, staff. We used our scanning uh, rig to get all the data for the coin. So we used the overhead, uh, we used the reflex camera, a pretty new one, so 24 megapixels, so the resolution was uh, good. We, one thing that was necessary to buy absolutely was uh, a, a macro lens because you are very close to the object, less than 50 centimeter, and most lenses cannot focus at this distance in a reliable way. You need a macro lens. Macro lens are extremely costly because they, they are heavy, a lot of uh, lenses inside. So this was uh, one of the costlier things in, uh, in the project. So everything else was around 1,000 euro. This, the, the lens was alone 700 euros. And, but while well, we are reusing it, it's not that uh, single-use uh, lens. <laughs> um, so we use the, 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 the dome that I described before. Uh, 116 uh, white LED and the computer controls uh, all the light and the camera. So you have this white box here, plus the camera is, is also connected to, to the computer. The software makes the, the dome switch to the next light and then shoot the photo and transfer the data. The time for each coin is around 15 minutes. This may sound crazy. This is a lot of time. However, most of the time is spent in doing things that are not the, uh, the acquisition itself. Uh, each photo takes a uh, very short time. However, transferring the data for 24 megapixel images over a USB cable that for most camera is a USB 1, USB 2, if you are lucky, takes time, takes second. Uh, the initial setup is you put the, the coin, you center it on the, on, on the pad, and then you uh, change the zoom sometime, because some coin are very small, some other are a bit larger, so you try to zoom as much as possible. 
you evaluate which is the uh, correct exposure for the, the set, and then you are ready to go. These things take uh, one minute, two minutes, and then you have to do one side and the other side. So it's like five minutes, uh, 30 seconds for the real scan, of which, uh, of, the, of those five minutes, at least two minutes are just data transfer between the camera and the, um, the computer. Normally you are shooting in RAW to have some uh, better color correction. So the, the time spending in uh, moving, you cannot keep everything on the camera because otherwise you will have to change the, the, uh, the SD quite often. It's not possible to use the, uh, those kind of uh, Wi-Fi uh, SD card because you cannot really control when the data arrives. So your software will con constantly wait for uh, new input. So, and the time for the, um, the person of the museum taking up the coin, uh, polishing it, give us the, the coin, and then putting it back and get the next coin, at the end it was 15 minutes per coin. Most of the time, again, was spent in doing something else, but still taking uh, consideration that it is fast, but not as fast as 3D from photos like you take two minutes and you get a very good result without having done, uh, you still need some setup. And, count, and taking account that here everything else is automatic. So the demo, I, I already showed you the, um, the kiosk. Oh no. Of course, in Italian and English, because uh, we will cover local population plus uh, tourist. It's possible to have, uh, uh, if you select uh, demo, it will uh, show, uh, show a video showing how to navigate inside the, the web interface and how to work with the, with the different coins. All this stuff here is about uh, the museum, the background, the coin collection, why the museum has a coin collection, because most of the time someone was a collector and then left all this collection to the museum, or some coin have been bought and sold between museums. So everything here is uh, not coin. Here are the coins. So with this interface, you select uh, the coin. It was the time when the cover flow, uh, Macintosh style cover flow was coming out. So everyone was trying to use a uh, graphical arrangement that looked like the, the cover flow. So you select the, the coin, you have some information about the coin. Um, you can flip the coin using this, uh, this thing. You can zoom in, zoom out. At the moment, you are changing the illumination. So if you click and pan, you are changing the illumination. If you click here, there's too few con contrast on this uh, screen. But here is panning mode, and this is light changing uh, mode. This is, again, a help that tells you what's, uh, what's about the coin and everything else, uh, what's, uh, how to use the, the interface. And uh, here, you can turn on and off uh, the hotspot on the coin. So everything here is transmitted uh, progressively. So when you open the, when you're on a local kiosk, everything comes out immediately on the network like we are. Uh, data is streamed, so when I zoom, I have the same effect like in uh, Google Earth when uh, in, uh, better data just overwrite the lower resolution data. So if I, if I zoom in, I probably already transmitted everything. I can change the illumination. I flip the coin. I really love this animation because it's really nothing. You just 
that the, the canvas is squeezed and then open again. Because, but it really looks like a uh, toss of a coin. Well, not really, but gives the impression. It also gives the, the, the good uh, feedback to the user that something is happening and is uh, has not to wait for a loading and nothing is happening. You're, he sees immediately uh, visual uh, feedback. And uh, I don't know if, I think most of the coin have some kind of information. Some are more local than the others, so the system uh, for each um, for each of these uh, hotspots, you define a position and then a zoom and pan level. So if the detail is really small, you can have the viewer zoom on that specific area. So it gives you a better uh, understanding of the local uh, of the local feature. And uh, basically, that's it. Everything can be controlled by one single finger, because now I have the mouse, so I, but it was uh, done for a touch screen. So I can control everything using a uh, simple gesture without uh, modifiers, which is really, really important. People are used to do this kind of stuff. At the moment, in this case, for example, we haven't implemented the pinch to zoom because it was not yet as popular as now it is. Now popular, people expect this behavior. So if you are planning to write some kind of web application that run on, on tablet or mobile devices or anything, always put in the pinch to zoom. Everyone is using it. Also people non, completely non-experienced. The problem of designing interfaces for the public is trying to fit everything that in a way that is familiar to the user, even if it's not an expert of this field. This cover flow thing, I really don't like it. It was uh, one of those things that came out continuous. Everyone was using it. However, since everyone was using it, people understood this thing very well, that by touching and moving, uh, moving the finger, not on the, on the projection board, of course, uh, the thing will scroll. This is a very simple trick. Try to exploit the previous knowledge of the user. If you're designing an interface for the expert, it doesn't care. The expert can spend 10 minutes learning on the, on the interface, even though if it's easy to learn, it's much better. If you are designing interfaces for the public, for the general public, never ever rely only on your experience and on your colleague to test the interface. Because all of you have more or less the same background. What you think it's easy to use, it may be a nightmare for anyone not in your field. Always remember this, uh, this thing. We made a lot of error in the early year thinking that navigation of a 3D was simple stuff and was just using the trackball and going around and just click and drag and double click and with uh, modifiers on a, on a keyboard. That's not how people react to a complex interface. So, and every time you touch some of those buttons, the view just reset. That's another lesson that we learned. That people get lost in the interface. So they zoom and pan until they are looking at uh, this, uh, this piece of uh, textile here. And they don't find a way uh, back. So everything you click that is not a coherent way, the view just reset. And another lesson is, if you are implementing a kiosk like this thing, put a timer. After a certain amount of seconds that no one touched it, you restart to the main page. Because people come, find themselves here, and they have no idea there's something else to see in the kiosk. You see that this web application is fairly simple, and most of the component directly use HTML entities. 
So this was a JavaScript uh, component that we found on the web, one of those free components that you use. It's just a JavaScript file you put inside, you configure it, and it works. Everything else is just text and HTML uh, canvases and everything. This makes things really portable. These things, in theory, should work also on your cell phone. Uh, the, problem, the only problem with cell phone is that the screen is so small that these buttons aren't effective anymore. But the main interaction will probably work because everything is, uh, is standardized. And for most of the things that you want to implement in a kiosk, you have text, you have images, you may have video, you have sound, you have buttons, you have mouse drag and click. That's it. You don't need anything else. So this for so much for the demo. I want to show you now the creation of a PTM. So first I will show you a PTM and do some um, RTI. If you go inside the folder that I gave you, you will find these these and these, which are already uh, made PT, uh, polynomial text to a map. So one PTM, oh, the, the three, uh, the, all of three are PTM. So they are already, you can look at it and you will see what, uh, what's inside. Here there is the RTI viewer setup, so the software to view the relatable images. And this one is the one to create the relatable image. This is the instruction for using this software here, the builder. Then the, uh, the two example, one is the off, one of the official example of the, of the PTM. And this one, this one is a not so good data set, but still it's usable for initial test that we captured with the student at the last course. So now I will show you uh, the, 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 the PTM, and uh, I'll just steal. This. So now that I have installed the RTI viewer, if I just double click on, the, on a PTM or uh, the other format, it's just loading up the, uh, the, so the file. It takes a bit of time because the file is uh, 70 megabytes. Because it's really large, is, um, you can zoom a lot. So all the things that you may expect, you have the minimap to, uh, to, to zoom in a position. Here you can move the light. And here you have the option to, uh, to take the, um, to load and save uh, your data. Or you can take a screenshot so you can save uh, images that you generate using the PTM. And in the rendering mode, you see all the announcements that I showed you before. So I may use the fuse gain, the specular announcement, and all the other kind of unsharp masking and uh, image uh, processing stuff. Uh, if I check uh, one, for example, so I may show the object uh, using a normal view, which is more or less exactly as it appears in reality. On the fuse gain is not changing very much, but yes, it is. Oh, yeah, it is. The specular announcement makes everything look like it's made of plastic. But uh, it's much easier now. I don't know if it's visible here. That also the wing are not only carved, but there is also small scratches that try to uh, make visible like the effect of the feather. 
Again, it's not a realistic rendering, but helps you a lot in understanding scratches and uh, study, for example, the traces of the making of, the, of this artwork. And you have a lot of uh, parameters that you can change in order to, to see better the, what you wanted to see. And here you have the static multi-light and dynamic multi-light. So uh, with the static multi-light is calculating which is the, bet, uh, the best illumination possible for the, I think for the R, uh, yeah? So as I showed you, it tried to put light all around the object in order to uh, have a, um, a constant illumination while dynamic multi-light you just give a suggestion and you try to compute to slightly bend the light direction in order to still have a, a principal direction but to have more contrast all over the scene. And here, you, in this case, you are controlling, uh, it's not doing it for every pixel, but it's doing on windows that are 32 pixel by 32 pixel, and the offset maximum in this case, so I'm indicating this light direction, and it can change up to 10 degrees to get a better uh, image. Then the last thing I want to show is the normal rendering. So the surface, uh, this is the a representation of the, of, the uh, of the geometry, which again is not contained here. We don't have an explicit geometry. This is an approximation on, on uh, the, uh, the direction of the surface of the geometry according to the kind of illumination that we, are, uh, that we have. So, Looking at the behavior of the optical behavior, it is highly probable that the surface has this orientation. PTM can be compressed a lot because there's not a redundancy. So if you zip them, they become really, really small, so it can transmit it also in this case very well because of this uh, property. Now we will see how to generate this PTM starting from the individual file. This is a, ba a cop bus relief, well not a bus relief, uh, how is it called? Um, repoussé, so it has been uh, Not carved, uh, you know, uh, is this one, is this thing. And uh, it turned out good, but you will see that it's not, in some situation, things seem uh, a bit less, uh, not so sharp. This is because we were not able to keep the camera completely stable. So if you fail in keeping the perfect alignment, the effect that you will see is a bit of ghosting. And the ghosting may appear only on some lighting direction. Another problem that you may have is when I get close, I get a good representation here. But if I go like here, this is not realistic anymore. Things just flip out. Seems that uh, is, uh, uh, it's not uh, really like a photo. This means that in this area, we had not enough illumination. As I said, if you are going to use a dome, all the illumination are well distributed over the sphere, perfectly distributed over the sphere, and they are always in the same position. If you are moving the light, with your hand, you need to take care to cover as much as possible the hemisphere. If you fail to do so, some area will be less realistic because the interpolation will have something. But it's an interpolation. If there's nothing to interpolate, the data here will be kind of fuzzy. 
and the accuracy of the interpolation is, of course, better the more point you have. So one advice is always try to be as precise as possible in covering everything. So you see, uh, in any case, that even by working very fastly, uh, this is the result that you get, which is still not bad. With some uh, effort in putting back together the images in the in Photoshop, it will, gi will get perfect. And uh, now I'll show you the data. So inside the folder RTI example, there's a subfolder called JPEG export. Why? Because the software that create the, uh, uh, the RTI, for some reason that I still have to understand, want that the folder of the images is called JPEG export because it was designed at the beginning as uh, the companion of another tool that automatically took the photo and downloaded them on the, from the camera to the software. And that software used this name of folder. So every time you want to use, you need to put all the images inside the folder that has this precise name, JPEG line export. It's really stupid, but it is the way things uh, work. In the folder, you will see a lot of photos taken with a different illumination. And if I open one, we have the object itself plus the reflecting sphere, which is the easiest way of getting a black reflection sphere, is to go on Amazon and order an 8-ball for snooker. Because uh, snooker ball are incredibly precise and they are shiny and the eight ball is black. Uh, the software that you use just by chance work with black ball and red ball that are exactly the easiest ball to find if you are searching for pool ball in the uh, Please don't go to a bar and steal uh, the eight ball from the, from the pool, because people will get annoyed. But on, on Amazon, and sometimes they sell it also as a souvenir, as a keychain. So it's really easy to come by one of these. If you are acquiring an object from these sites to these sites, this is the perfect uh, thing. Otherwise, you will need to find a better... Uh, a, 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 a ball that has a size that is uh, closer to the object that you are acquiring. In any case, you want that in each photo, the ball is really visible and it's taking more or less the same illumination as the object. So, in this case, you see that we place uh, the object on a table and the ball just beside the table, more or less at the same depth. Don't go too close, otherwise the ball will make a shadow over the, over the object. Don't put these uh, too far inside of the table, because otherwise the, um, the border of the table, when you go down with the light, will make shadow out of it. Um, it's not really important if the ball is here, is here, is here, or is here. Of course, the closer it is to the center, the better. You are always working with the assumption that light is uh, directional. So try to have the light far from the object and try to, to use a diffuse uh, cone. Not a diffuser. Light should be directional, should not be diffused. But if you don't have a LA, don't use, there are different light, uh, there are many light sources. Some light sources have a light bulb with a very, very small um, illumination part. These act like the point, a point uh, light source, which is not good. If you have uh, one very powerful but not so small light bulb, it's okay. In this case, we use a 1000 uh, watt um, spot with the reflector on the back that is able to cover two or three times. So the, if you look at the, uh, at the cone of light, it's like two times or three times the size of the object. So you are fine. 
Try to move the light keeping more or less at the same distance of the object. Remember that in this case you have no guide, you are not measuring. You are like when you take photos on the uh, 3D from photos, going like this. So you are moving and shooting. The, the camera should be on a tripod. Really, there's no human being that is able to keep the, the camera uh, stable. On a tripod, possibly shooting using a remote release cable. Because if you go and press the button every time, you are mo moving everything. So a remote release cable, you may want to raise the, um, the, the, the mirror if you have the possibility to reduce uh, vibration also in this case. The camera should be pointed in the center of the object as much as possible. And the camera should be put in manual mode and keep the same parameters all across the acquisition. You are mixing data. What a camera normally does is when the light changes, it adapts the parameters in order to produce always the same image. You don't want this. You want that the image with the light coming from this direction is really dark. Because if you keep all the parameters of the camera fixed in a certain uh, configuration, all the photo will be more or less in the same uh, energy space. This is not really true because the camera, even in manual mode, even when it's shot raw, it will do some uh, tweaking of the parameters to capture light and to do image processing. So you are not really capturing pure absolute data. But again, you are doing an approximation of the illumination, so it's fine. So before starting with the photo, put the camera straight with the object, out of focus with all the light that you can uh, turn on, then put manu uh, put uh, um, stop the autofocus, put in manual photos, and sometimes I just tape the focus ring. So even by chance or even by uh, touching it, the focus ring will not move. I use tape a lot because things tend to move. Uh, aperture and time. The shorter the time, the better, because the shorter the time, the better, uh, uh, the, the less noise uh, you have on the on vibration. Uh, focus uh, aperture here is not really important because everything is more or less on the same depth plane. If you are working on very small object, be careful with the aperture because even coin taken with a macro lens may have uh, a depth that is larger than the uh, depth range of the of your camera. So be careful in that case. So you want to take uh, to establish a time which is not too short or not too long and an aperture which is wide enough uh, to uh, be able to focus everything but small enough to, um, to keep things uh, sharp. Um, well, small enough to keep things sharp but uh, was the opposite. Uh, and how you do measure light. So if you expose and set the time for the light in the straightest position, this will come out well, but everything will become really, really dark. If you expose for this light position, everything will become uh, overexposed. So my advice is normally to expose for the light coming at 35 or 30 degrees. So to have a, an exposure level that is more or less good for the entire hemisphere. When the light is here, it will be a bit dark. When the light is here, it will be slightly oversaturated, but you will have a good compromise between the two positions. So none of the two will be unusable. Remove the um, light balance. So set the light balance once with the light turned on in order to have the light, uh, the, the white balance correct with respect to the light that you are using, and or put a, col a color checker here, 
to do color correction later. In this way, all the photos will have the same white balance, the same focal, and the same aperture and um, shutter speed. In this way, all the data coming from different photos is more or less in the same energy space. So you can compare the lighting, the, um, the luminance of one pixel from, uh, uh, from a photo with the luminance of a pixel on another photo. And you are not comparing bananas with apples, like my professor used to say. You are comparing slightly different bananas one to the other, but still in the same uh, kind of fruit. Uh, the photo should be able to frame this and this. You can crop it out later. I repeat, it's not important in this case to keep the center. You may crop also this part here if you want. It's because you are working at a pixel per pixel level. So it's not important to have the perspective of the image. I will show some of these images and then I will show the software. So you see that we move it uh, around, and if you look at the sphere ball, you see how the light position is changing. On the sphere. On some photo, it's almost impossible to see the sphere, but it's not important. OK, let's open up the tool for the for the creation of the thing. So let's see, LTI build. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. LTI build is made using Java. This means that you have to install Java on your machine. Java is like a virus and every 20 minutes want to update and everything seems to go slower when uh, Java is used. I have nothing against Java. It's that most of the time it seems that every software that is made in Java is a terrible software. It's not the problem of Java. But OK, uh, project name, you give it a name. And you may use uh, one of these uh, uh, pre-made setup. Highlight-based. PTM or uh, hemispherical uh, harmonic map. Highlight based means I, I will get the position of the, of the light from the highlight on a sphere. Dome, LP or LP means I will have uh, uh, um, the, 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 the direction of the light already coded in a file, so I will have uh, already known the, 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 the direction of light. So in this case, we want to use one of these two. We will fit a PTM and uh, go on. So I will, will just give the name. On the copper thing, it's a Madonna, so I will write Madonna. And PTM uh, fit, start new project. Now I open the folder. Containing, uh, my, containing my my data. And it will start loading the images. Here you may add uh, some uh, metadata to the project, so the, the author, the, the other data that you want to store. And this data will be stored in the file. It's like an exif. So if you have something that you want to remember, you may add it here. Now it's loading all the images. It takes some time. I already used some sampled images. So it's, uh, oh, the, the processing times grows exponentially the more, for, the more pixel you have, of course. Uh, now you may want to check, or oh, before using them, you want to check the old images are sharp enough. If some images has come out blurry, just remove it. Or you may remove it also here and annotate why you removed it. So all, the, all this data will be saved in a folder, in an XML file containing all the, all the processing steps. This is really nice because you have documentation of what you have uh, done. But in this case, I already checked. Everything is OK. So I go next. And now I have to select the area of the photo that I use to recognize the sphere. 
So I get one of the photos where the light comes uh, more or less straight ahead, and I, uh, I select an area around the sphere. And uh, and I'm using a black glossy ball, and I say detect sphere. The software will go on and try to find, in, using this photo and all the other photo, where exactly is the sphere. If the sphere is on top of a background that is easy to, to, to process, the result will be good. In this case, the background is kind of noisy, so it's a problem. So it proposes a solution, and this is something that is generated by looking at all the images. But now I will refine this selection because it's not really good enough. So if I go here, for example, I see that the, the, the fitting was not that good. So I fit my sphere. Yeah, this will be more or less OK. Set new center. Then I go next, and I do a highlight uh, detection. Highlight detection will look at all the photo and try to find the brightest spot. So it will know for each photo uh, which is the, the direction of the, of the illumination. Remember, the, 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 the sphere should be 200 pixel, 300 pixel in the photo, that's why it's the process has a very high error, and uh, it takes some time because it's doing on uh, 77 uh, photo, and uh, in the end it will give me a, a summary of the position, and you may go and check each one, if you are not sure that the process went good, to uh, ensure that the position of the light was good. Seems that he did it. So he found, in this case, you see the red cross here. So he found the position of the highlight. If I go in another, uh, in another one, like this one, OK. You see that he is able to find the center very well in all the photo. And this is the summary of all the points. You see what I told you before, that this area here is less represented than this area here. This gives you an idea of how well you sampled the, the, the light space. If you see some area missing, means that in that position, the approximation will not be good. It's really nice. We could have gone a bit taller, but we didn't have the, the tripod to move the light. And this part is missing. It's just that here we cannot place it because it's where the camera is. So you cannot go. But I have enough point around that the central position is not so important. So this gives you a good idea of how well you cover the space. You go on with next. And now you can, if you want, crop your image. So I use crop, and I say I want the PTM only of this part. I'm using sphere number one because I selected uh, the, this one sphere. I can save luminance RGB or RGB, and I can change the, the output file name, and uh, then change anything. You, you know exactly where the fit uh, is. And then I just go execute, and the software goes and produce a PTM. So the minimal equipment is, you get one of those uh, IKEA lamps that are very cheap, uh, 
and have an LED and you can just move around. A camera with a tripod and uh, a black... Uh, oh, I'm not sure that I put... Oh, um, I probably had to put another file here. Uh, well, I will uh, take a look at it and tell, uh, tell you later. I probably had to put another file in the, in the folder, sorry. I, I will have to download the fit and, uh, and put it in, uh, inside. Uh, in any case, you will find the instruction in the PDF that I gave you. So at the end of the process, it will save the, the PTM, and that's it. So on the software side, now it's fairly automatic to do all the, uh, all the work. You need to be careful in setting up the measurement, um, the measurement setup. Because uh, uh, small problems in alignment of pixel, small problems in illumination, small problems in, uh, in detecting the sphere, makes these things harder and the result is not so good. Otherwise, it's really something that can be done quickly and with very few equipment. So for some kind of object, or even for object that you have uh, scanned or you, are, or you have modeled, you may have some detail that you want to document in this way. It's simple and it's effective. And it's used a lot in, uh, in cultural heritage and there are a lot of things that you may do with the data coming out of it. The next step, of course, would be try to create geometry out of this thing using photometric stereo. But as I said, it's not this simple. So go from this value that is uh, this kind of value which are good but not metric in the, um, in the nature. To go to a metric representation, you need to be very, very careful in um, calibrating the entire system. And this is where you spend a lot of time and a lot of effort in doing so. You have to calibrate the exact uh, uh, luminance of the light because even if you bought a hundred LED from the same company in the same batch, not all of the LED will have the same uh, luminance level. You need to really calibrate well the position of the illumination, not like in this case just using a sphere and saying, oh, the sphere is more or less coherent with the rest of the object and the direction will be good enough. You need to really know the position of light, the amount of light coming in every position. Here you assume that light is uh, uniform all across the object. In reality, it is not because you have still attenuation and uh, this light dispersion. So things that are farther away are less illuminated. If you do not take care of it when you try to do photometric stereo, things will just explode in your hands. So it's really easy to get to this point. All the software is here. It's available. Some of it is open source. Some other is uh, so well documented that you can re-implement the calculation inside other software or inside MATLAB. Going further is a mess. People that work a lot with the PTM also do photometric stereo. You get astonishing detail because you work with the resolution of, uh, of macro lenses, so you get uh, really detailed geometry, really high resolution stuff. However, it takes a lot of processing and filtering the data in order to obtain something usable. So be careful. Is something uh, um, someone working in computer vision and uh, computer graphics and informatics in general can be able to do, and uh, it's a good uh, way to build your own uh, scanner for small things, but be aware that it's not uh, such an easy thing as you may imagine at the beginning, because the, the, the principle, again, is simple. Making it work in a precise and completely automatic way without having to recalibrate every day, spending one hour a day recalibrating the system, is all that matters. Okay, I finished for the PTM and uh, other stuff. If you have questions or things that you wanted to ask about this process, uh, please do so. Yes? Uh, 
it depends on your distance. I mean, we were able to, in this case, the depth is uh, like uh, a couple of millimeter, and we are at uh, one meter from the object. So from that distance, everything seems more or less flat. In the case of coin, the eight was uh, one millimeter more or less, and we were at uh, 50 centimeters. So again, for the, um, for the bus relief of the, uh, of the Roman sarcophagus, the depth was uh, 5 to 10 centimeters, and we were a couple of meters away. And still, it, it looked at, with, with the good lengths, it looked uh, almost flat. You may, do, uh, you may do the side of a building if you want to, and use the sun as the moving uh, light. But if you get as close as to see the, the three-dimensionality of the object, this thing will just don't work. It doesn't look realistic anymore. If the thing, from your point of view, is flat enough, so a photo is enough to convey the entire information of the object, you're fine. So if I see the box at the end of the room, I see them from here, looks like all a flat area, even though there is one meter depth in those boxes. And it's fine. If I get close, I will start to see the, the, the depth and, uh, and all the parallel side of the boxes, and it will not uh, work anymore. So it's a question of ratio between your point of view and the, the depth of the scene. It should be neglectable from the point of view that you are looking at. Any other question, curiosity, or um, things to ask? Okay, so I will use uh, my last half hour in showing you uh, one of the things that uh, came out uh, frequently in the last uh, two or three days about the re referencing of a model, georeferencing of the model. Uh, this is done differently in many, the, this is done with a different interface in many, in many software, but the principle is always the same you have some kind of geometry and you have some, you know where these objects should be in, a, in some reference space because you know that this point should have a certain coordinate, a certain x, y, z coordinate. And you know that this point should have a series of other coordinates because you measured this point using a, some kind of uh, off-picture reference system in the case of a um, total station or with the GPS, uh, or with some other devices. So you know you have this object floating in space in your 3D uh, reference system in any possible position, and maybe in an, in an unknown scale. So if the object came from uh, three different photos, it may be that it's in a scale that is completely unknown. But you know for sure that some point of the object need to go in a specific position. How you get this data depends a lot. You may have another reference 3D model, so you can pick points on that uh, reference model. You may have used the GPS, you may have used the georeferencing of the, of the camera on board of the drone, you may have used the total station, whatever. You know, for a series of points on your 3D surface, uh, they are coordinate. And you generally have, for these, uh, an indication of where these points are. They may be features that you can actually really see on the 3D model because maybe they are marked, maybe they, they are special uh, point marked, or they may be a description like I am using as a reference point the top right in uh, the, well, this is out the corner of the wall, of the door. So. Th that point there, I will use it as a uh, reference system, as a reference point. So you need some numerical values 
plus a series of uh, information of where those points are. Um, unfor unfortunately, I forgot the, that the official data set that we have for showing this stuff. So I created one on the fly the, uh, um, the other morning, and I will use this. So I will load a 3D model now. di Corso India Demo GeoRef I have here a 3D model of an excavation that is clearly not in, a, in any reference system if I look at the axis, I see that it's not on the origin and is not straight to any of the axes. This is the kind of result that you may expect by uh, 3D from images. It is also not in any known scale. Uh, small thing, I don't know why this data set was in centimeters. Strange, maybe we converted for some reason, but in origin this data was in centimeter. But if I take a measurement now, it's not in any uh, usable measurement. So this is normally what you start with. Then what you have, you have this thing here, so some points that tells you, well, for each point a name, in order to be easy to, to, to uh, uh, being able to address each point with a, with, with a unique name. And these are coordinates. So these are the final coordinates of my 3D model. And then I have this. I have an instruction image. So in order to understand that these points here is point A1, this is A2, this is A3, and so on. Uh, the point that we are searching is the centroid of this colored area. It may not be the centroid. It may be the, the topmost point. Uh, in this case, normally it's written here. So when people use uh, markers, like uh, just a piece of plastic, uh, like in this case, or this these are, um, you know, when construction work and you have the, the metal spike, they sometimes put a plastic cover on top of it to avoid people being impaled on it. So archaeologists sometimes just you get these, uh, these reference things that are cheap and they are durable and they, they just uh, put it on, uh, in the ground and use them as a way to measure stuff around your, uh, your data. So, I know which are the points that I have to search on this 3D model, and I know their names. And on the other file, I have all the position that I want. Uh, this may not be the case. This may be saved inside uh, some GIS uh, tool or some other reference tool, or maybe the, um, you know, when you're doing a, a survey using the total station, you have uh, those numbers, so X, Y, Z, Point A1 as X, Y, Z, point A2 as uh, this other number. But you don't have this, so people normally write down the, the points. So point one was on top of the wall, uh, right side, uh, in, the most, uh, in the most corner. It's more dangerous than having a graphical thing, but still works. So you, you need to know the coordinates, but you also need to know where these coordinates should go in this model because the procedure is really simple. You have to start with your 3D model. You have to pick this coordinate and tell the system, you know, this coordinate from this number, this, co this uh, x, y, z, should really go into this other coordinate. And you do it for all the points that you have. Again, you need a minimum number of points. The bare minimum is three. Never use three is uh, too prone to having uh, problems about uh, uh, ambiguity 
or a situation where the error is uh, way too much. And uh, never use 100 points because you have to manually pick them. So some points, not many. So normally each software uses a different interface, but the principle is always the same. You may pick point on the geometry that has to move, and then you enter x, y, z coordinate in another window. And then there's a way to calculate the roto translation. I will show how it happens in, uh, inside MeshLab, which is I've loaded my points here. I loaded my 3D model here. I display points so it's slightly faster. And I want to reference it. The, uh, the icon is this one, reference scene. Now I have again an interface that let me pick points and create new point. So I can add a new point that automatically gets a, gets a name. And if I select it, I can pick the current point on the moving one. So now I have picked my point. I don't like it. OK, now it's more centered. This is the current position. And here I enter, I will enter the destination position. If I do it for a series of points, I can georeference my scene. However, it's really tedious to um, to enter point by point. So if you have a text file that is in this format, so a simple text file, name of the point, x, y, z, next line, name of the point, x, y, z, you can just load it inside the interface. Uh, there are many software that can export uh, text lists uh, like this. So, for example, the Leica uh, software for the Total Station or uh, so other software. For it. It's really easy. From GIS, it's easy to export data in this text form. And that's why I chose to, to put it in this way. So, First of all, I don't want to use all these points because there are too many and I have. So I make a copy out of it and then I use uh, A1, A3, B1, B3, and then these three I will use it uh, all. So if I now here load reference points from file and I load points. You already created all the lines that I need, and the, the destination point is already OK. So I know because I did it uh, recently that the A1, A2, A3, I can check, but is A1, A2, A3. So if I go to A1 and I pick. Uh, A1. Pick point on moving, OK. And this is A3. Oh, no, I loaded the one that had the, all the points. OK. A2. Well, it's faster than I thought. A3. These are B1, B2, and B3. So B1, B2, and B3. And then I need the C. 
I think this is C1, so it's C1, C2, C3. C1, C2, and C3. you see that the destination point are here. So these are the point that I picked on the moving one, and these are the reference. So C1 reference, C1 should start here and will finish here. Then from the interface, I can, of course, uh, if I double click on one number, I can modify it. If I double click here, uh, if I double click here, I change the name of the point. If I double click here, I make this point active or inactive. This means that it is considered to compute the uh, roto translation, or it's not considered to compute the roto translation. Because sometimes you have a lot of points, but some points maybe are not really sure. Then you start in this way and you take a look at the final error. So, now I can, since I have enough point, I can calculate the roto translation. Uh, however, I may, uh, there are two possible situations. My data comes from a scanner, so it is already in the correct scale, so I want only to apply a rigid roto translation. In some other cases, the data is out of scale, so I want to allow a uniform scaling. So I want to recover in one single step the scale plus the orientation and positioning. Remember, if you know for sure that your data is already in the correct scale, never ever apply a scale, because uh, it may be that the the simplest, situ the simplest solution is to move it a bit and then scale it, while the, the correct thing should be rotate and move and uh, do something. So if the data is correctly scaled, never allow scaling. If your data is in a different scale, like in this case, I will allow uniform scaling. Uh, this software, this uh, plugin again will give you some feedback, so it will tell you which is the current point, what you have to do, so when I click at the pick current point here, it, it's written, now pick on the moving uh, mesh and so on. So now I have all the points and I can calculate the roto translation. So I will click a low uniform scaling and then calculate the roto translation. A low because I want, yeah, calculate roto translation. Now, closer to the object, to the point, if I go here, I see that this is A3. A3, according to my reference, should come here this is where it arrives, considering the matrix that I calculated. So how it, is this matrix calculated? This matrix calculated is the least square uh, matrix that bring all these points in all these other points. So I'm trying to distribute the error, so I'm trying to uh, minimize the error of this translation. Why there is an error? Because uh, even if you have a clear description of the point that you have to click on, it might be impossible to click on the specific point, or maybe because it's simply it's not in the mesh. It's not, uh, you have uh, points here, 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 and here, and you need to do the middle one. So you made a small mistake in picking points. This is perfectly normal. 
and you have the error of the fitting here. So for each point, I give the error with respect to the target. So instead of arriving at this coordinate, I arrive at a, at a coordinate which is wrong by 1.1 .1 watt. Again, the unit of the final space. So this is 1.1 .1 centimeter. So I, when I picked A1, well, I was probably very careless. While the other, you see that the, the result is much better for all the other. No, it was not. It was B2. So take, let's take a look at the, at the errors and see if we found some error, some point that is completely wrong. Now, all points are good, say, for B2. So I may, if I put it inactive, I see that the error gets better. No, A3 actually seems a bit uh, farther away. But generally, the level of error is below the other, so it's, co it's OK. Uh, let's forget this uh, not a number. It's a, it's a bug. I corrected it uh, for the next uh, release. So now that I have a good roto translation, I can apply it. So I apply it, and my model gets in the correct reference space, and it's in a centimeter. So I see that the origin is correctly placed on this corner of the object, like, I, uh, like it was at the beginning. And the x-axis is somehow parallel to the excavation level. I may do something else. Uh, since this thing is normally a, uh, a step that is crucial to be able to have data that is reliable for the alignment, for the processing afterwards, I may also save, export all referencing data to a file. So I have some kind of log that I can use later on to tell the people ref results. If I save it, I go here and I open it with the proper software. And it tells me that I use at this point on the original, uh, on the, um, no. These were the points that, that I picked on my moving 3D model. These were the reference point that came from the external source. I asked for a non-rigid transformation using eight reference point. Using eight because remember the one, uh, one I just discarded it. And here is the matrix that I generated. And here are uh, the residual. I have a problem with the indices. Uh, you know the classical thing about uh, off by one, computer science after all. Uh, when I display the error, so the error actually are shifted in this way. And I just get uh, one over the, the thing. It's a good thing that I resized the array before, so it doesn't just explode. It's the, just the getting a, num a number that means nothing. So um, I corrected the bug, uh, and in the next uh, release will uh, will work uh, much better. So you have uh, all the uh, all the residual, which is a good information. So you know which point were better, which were worse, and which is the final level of error of the entire. Um, georeferencing. This is the kind of stuff you find in all the software that is used for georeferencing. So the, the interface may change, the data that you use and the kind of feedback is the same everywhere. Now remember that I created a roto translation matrix, so if I want to apply it to my 3D model, I have to freeze the matrix inside MeshLab and then export the model. Uh, or, or I just keep using it as a matrix inside, uh, inside MeshLab. Uh, I know for sure that the interface is almost exactly the same on Cloud Compare, for example. On uh, Photoscan, as a very similar thing. So you just pick points on the thing that has to move, enter value or import value from the data coming from uh, terrestrial laser, the um, total station or GPS, and you obtain the object roto-translated in the definitive uh, reference system.
So the principle remains this, it changed slightly the interface. One word about reference space. Most people working in the survey and working with geographical data use uh, reference space uh, which are absolute or really uh, reference uh, object to fiducial point that are in specific cities, in specific area. That point may be way far away, way far from your object. So it may be that even in meters, this reference point is not 40 something, is, it may be something that is like uh, uh, Let's al always think this was a strange case where the data was in centimeter. Normally, the data uh, coming from a terrestrial laser scanner is in meters. So if you have something that is at 24 kilometer from your excavation, which is pretty reasonable, it's not really difficult to have an excavation that is 25, 24 kilometer away from uh, the next fiducial point, you get numbers like 24,000, uh, 365 that are meters dot uh, 3104. So, since you are working on uh, uh, these are centimeters, centimeters, and these are millimeters, these numbers are terrible for the computer because they are very large. And what really counts is here. Computer has a finite way of storing numbers. And every time you multiply these numbers, you do some math over these numbers, you may have something that is called numerical cancellation. So some of these figures here may change or shift between two different configurations. So it may be that even if you had dot three one four or dot three two zero or dot three um, one eight, all these three, when you save it and you load it, everything will become this number here. So your three D model will start to appear jagged, so points that were far away just started to go together, and or when you display it, on, when you move around of the object, the object seems to move. Every point will really seems to shift from one position to the other, because you have this problem on memory and disk. Video cards are even worse because they use, uh, um, they do not guarantee that we will use the same amount of bit that you use it for storing your data when they are rendering. So a lot of the, not a lot, all the software that are born in the computer graphics world, software like MeshLab, Cloud Compare, uh, because they already use double, so to keep things slightly more stable, but only slightly more stable. All the software, MeshLab, Blender, uh, Maya 3D Studio, uh, a lot of the commercial viewer of, uh, of 3D data, some of the web viewer for the 3D data, everything that goes on, that use, uh, directly use uh, uh, video card, are unable to work with these kind of numbers. If here you have another number here, it's even worse. So be careful that if the number you are using for the georeferences is too large, you may have issues. You save it on a file. When you open the file, everything is clustered in, uh, in small points. And there's nothing you can do. Once you have lost uh, this data, once numerical cancellation happened, you are doomed. There is no way to get back to your original data. So always try to use local coordinate system. It's not a tragedy. 
you have your fiducial point there, you establish a local coordinate system near the area that you want to explore, and then you use the local coordinate system. The thing that I do normally is I take a look at all the reference points, I see up to which point everything skips the same, and I just delete these numbers here. Well, not delete. I keep somewhere that in order to obtain the correct reference point, I use this reference point, and then I add this number, the number that I removed. And it's perfectly fine. The only, to the only tool that can use this kind of number without any problem are GIS software and some software for a terrestrial laser scanner that can work on uh, absolute positioning system. Just be careful. It's not a thing that you can uh, solve. It's something that you have to take in mind if you're using a software that if you want to render this inside uh, Blender 3D Studio, if you want to show it online, if you want to work on it inside uh, uh, other uh, software made for computer graphics, you may want to use a local reference system. Otherwise, everything will appear wrong and you will lose the, the data that you have. Just this. If you are going to import inside uh, G GIS, it's okay. Save the data in text format, so it's no matter how long it is, it's still just a long text for the number, and that's it. And this, the GIS software will take care because they use uh, double precision, and in some cases they use arbitrary pre precision mathematics. If you are working with MATLAB, for example, I think there's a way to ask for infinite precision number, so numbers that I kept more or less like a string. So you can have number of any sites, and they are still numbers. So MATLAB can still process them and work with them. But you have to ask. It's not the, the standard uh, thing. Normally, people will use a float, and video card have a float as the, as the top level thing. Yes, you can have double, but it's an issue sometimes. You, if, you're using the, if you're asking for a double, you're absolutely not guaranteed. This means that in most cases, the uh, uh, driver will just, oh, he ask a double, this guy, nice idea. And then he will use float all around. But if the memory is running short, uh, video card can truncate also float. It's not, a, it's, a thing, it's not a thing that they, they write on the box, uh, we truncate floats. But in theory, the, the, the specification of the driver says that if uh, the driver thinks that is a good idea, or if it tries, is, the driver is uh, forced to, it may shift to a smaller number, uh, representation of number. This means that this stuff here will just vanish into nothingness. OK, uh, thank you for your attention. We see tomorrow, and we will uh, see different things. Again, we'll mix and match and uh, uh, some project and some uh, other thing about processing data visualization and uh, so on. So see you tomorrow.